When you're trying to create content with partners and influencers, you've got to think about what's in it for them. So many times when we go to do partner marketing or marketing together with influencers, we're begging them, can you, can you please, can you do us a favor? It's not really a value add to them. Well, in this episode of Marketing Together, Nick Capozzi with Demostack not only unpacks a seven state cross country Jeep tour, but also how to get influencers and partners that you want to create content with actually to say yes and to be excited about doing it. We even take a detour. See what I did there? This episode is full of puns, by the way, so just be forewarned. Anyway, in that part of the conversation, Nick explains how he ended up with some fire content that didn't involve him on camera or even asking any questions by just teeing up some partners and letting the cameras roll. All right, let's get into this episode because it is a good one. So the first thing we did was I pitched this wild idea to my boss, the uh, head of marketing at DemoStack, and I said, I have a crazy idea, like if you wanna go big, and here it is. And basically what we did was I spent uh, 30 days on the road, started in Phoenix, Arizona, went up through California into Oregon, Washington, back down through the Rocky Mountains, back to Phoenix, over 30 days. And we did two things with other people of influence on LinkedIn. One was we met people. So for example, we met Andy Paul in San Diego and we shot content around storytelling, which is what we were trying to promote, promote on the tour. Um, but then we also had some people drive with us for multiple days. So Will Aiken of Lavender, for example, spent four days driving from Utah to Colorado with us. And the idea was twofold. One, bartering social equity with influencers. Hey, Will, we'd love to feature you. We'd love to get you on camera. Will's maybe not the best example because he's so good on camera. Um, but Marcus Chan, we're coming through Portland. We want to interview you. We want to talk about what you know as it pertains to sales and storytelling. And then what we'll do is we'll interview you. We'll capture content together. But then I'll stand off camera and I'll interview you. I've, I'm a broadcaster by trade. I went to college for broadcasting. So now I can tell by that radio voice that I'm so jealous of, by the way, just for everybody listening. Yours is pretty good too, Lugan. Um, but basically, let me now get off camera. Let me lob you these questions, um, Marcus Chan, and gift you essentially content that you can now give to your own audience, positioning you as a subject matter expert. Not that Marcus needed that from me, but what was cool was, you know, we had a groundswell of people, and this was kind of big and buzzy around the LinkedIn world, at least in the corner where the sales tech uh, space lives. And, um, you know, we were interviewing people, gifting them content. So we got a lot of people to come out, frankly, uh, a surprising number of both people and the, the status of some of these people, like kind of caught us off guard of, of how this all worked. And that I think totaled, we interviewed in some way, shape or form, 40 people over 30 days. So it was a boatload of content for us, but again, we were gifting content, um, which we think was kind of the, the secret sauce to that. So that's in terms of how we worked with people of influence. A couple of things there that are interesting to me uh, in a previous episode, I got to interview my buddy, James Carberry, who I actually worked for and worked with at Sweetfish for four years. And a big part of our strategy there was what we called content based networking. Check out episode two after you finish listening to, to Nick and I here on marketing together. But uh, one thing we noticed, uh, the whole strategy there is create content with the people that you want to build relationships with, right? That could be buyers but it could also be influencers or partners. Some of that is becoming a little bit tougher, right? It used to be able to, you know, in the early days of Sweetfish, we would load up 200 emails in MailShake and just say, hey, Nick, we want to feature you on a podcast da, 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 and get, you know, tremendously high reply rates. Now there are more podcasts, there are more YouTube channels. So asking people to create content, if it's not positioned the right way, it doesn't land as a value add. It doesn't land as a gift. It seems like it's more of a, of a take. I think a couple of the things you guys did differently here, reposition that. Tell me about what you think. I have some ideas, but I want to hear straight from you. So I think really quickly, you're right. There, there is a lot of people in the landscape right now of, you know, creating content. I think the best way to, and, and if you were invited onto a podcast, even three years ago, it was like, oh, wow, I got invited to a podcast. But now you're right, there are a lot, I think, collaborating on content. So I think as opposed to saying, hey, listen, let me come in and run you through some questions. How can we do something that benefits kind of both sides, both companies, both personal brands, both company brands? 
what does that look like? What are the options and opportunities there? And I think that's what we kind of, how we leverage it. We said, look, we have a videographer on the tour with us. So not only will you have me interviewing you off camera, we have a great videographer. We're going to have these great backgrounds. You know, there's this one uh, scene of us in, in Port, well, there's so many of them, but we were talking to Jason Bay in Portland, Oregon, uh, with this beautiful cityscape behind us. And and that's going to catch it in the scroll, right? Whereas sometimes if you're doing a podcast, maybe I'm in my home office, maybe you're in your home office, and it doesn't have the same kind of draw. It might be an interesting story. But when you add interesting elements and interesting backdrops, I think that changes the dynamic. So I think, I think really, Logan, it's really about how you look at content and what can you elevate if everyone else is doing podcasts, which are great. I consume podcasts by the boatload. But if everyone's doing podcasts, what can you do that's a little bit different? And that's what we try to do there. Yeah. And, and that's right in line with what I was going to say. Like right when you ask them, hey, we're doing a Jeep tour and we want to interview you. Right. Their ears perk up because it's like I haven't been asked to be interviewed on a Jeep tour. Right. Um, two, you kind of pitch them on, hey, here's where we're going to invest in the quality of this. Right. And then third, what you said was not just, hey, we want to feature you and here's the story we're trying to tell. Here's the points we want to hit, right? Tie it in together to, hey, I saw you posted about this. That would actually fit with something that we're trying to do here and, and draw those uh, connections for them. Don't just ask them to show up and then assume that they're going to see that there's mutual value. And then I think the fourth thing is position a way to add even extra value. like. Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to interview you while I'm off camera and we're going to give you the raw footage, or we're even going to post-produce that. And here's what it's going to look like another way to add value early. So tell me a little bit about how some of those conversations went. Once you kind of pitch them on the value, what was the execution? Like, what did you learn? Maybe would have done differently or things that surprised you that went well, that maybe you weren't planning on. So I think what was really interesting was just, and I should have better position that after 30 days, I was going to have all of this content. And then how do we distill that down? I mean, we were driving, shooting and editing essentially 24 hours a day. So I think for, you know, we were boiling the ocean. We got it pretty warm. I don't know that we boiled it. Got, got, definitely got it pretty warm. Um, but I think if we had kind of more resources for what we were trying to pull off, we could have landed it better. But that's me standing back and looking what could we truly have done better i think for the optics of the people involved who are not part of demo stack i think they were really blown away with it and it goes back to your original question was how did we position this we nailed it exactly the way you nailed it here's what we're doing here's what's going to be interesting about it we we there was also a scarcity aspect of we have this date this time this date in san diego can you make that work and I, the other thing that I did was I took uh, custom vidyards of every every person I wanted to reach out to. It was a vidyard video. It was, hey, Zoe, we're coming through Denver. We would love to, you know, make some content with you. Um, so they were also seeing me. It was humanizing me. And a lot of these relationships I already had because I'm very active in LinkedIn. But there were people that I didn't know. And I think having the video gave them a really good North Star of what we were trying to do. I see that all the time when I usually reach out to people to collaborate on content, whether that's our webinar series I've been running at Teamwork or this podcast, uh, I'm sending a personalized video. I think you and I traded voice messages and bid yards when we were going back and forth here. So not to get too meta. But, but I think it's relevant, right? I think it's, you know, like, for example, a lot of people reach out to me via my LinkedIn inbox because either they don't have my email, although my email is probably even more of a mess than my LinkedIn inbox, but things can get lost in there. But if someone sends me a voice note or a video, I will always prioritize that because one, you know, there is a lot of uh, inauthentic connection requests. I think there's a lot of automation that I'm not telling you anything you don't know. So if I see that it's video or I see that it's audio, A, someone put enough effort B, I'm going to assume that it's personalized as opposed to being kind of spammy. So um, I think I think that's important. I think just in your day-to-day -day interactions outside of whether you're selling or you're marketing or you're working on partnerships, I think that authenticity that comes from a personalized response, I think, is key to getting a response back. Absolutely, man. So we talked a little bit so far about like how to get people involved in this sort of kind of splashy content collaboration. And, uh, I, you know, we compared that to, hey, come be on my podcast 
we're going to record it in each of our home offices. Some of the differences there. Let's talk about some of the differences in getting them to share it, right? Because I have both been on the sending side and the receiving side of, hey, we recorded this podcast. We've got three quote graphics and we've got a couple video clips you can use on LinkedIn. I'm going to post them. And, and sometimes that goes really, really well. Both of you share on both sides and you get a lot of engagement. Sometimes it's crickets. And I've tried a couple of different routes here to actually like, hey, let's let's plan out when I'm going to post, when you're going to post. I've tried it just kind of naturally and organically. And I wouldn't say that one way always works versus the other. It seems to be depending on the person, the relationship, all that sort of stuff. So on kind of co-sharing the content, everything on the show is about together. So it's not just recording the content together. It's getting it out there together. What would you say has been your experience kind of hearing me talk through that? So I, I think you nailed that. The only thing I think that sometimes is difficult is if you go on a lot of podcasts, um, you know, and it's like, hey, can you post all this stuff? And then your your LinkedIn profile becomes a lot about, you know, all these podcasts you're going on. Or, or I think if it's something that's not a regular thing that you're doing, I think it's a great way to promote both sides. But I think where the opportunity is outside of podcasting is really getting a little bit more granular in the capture of two people back and forth. So for example, a couple of weeks ago, we had two really interesting people, uh, Raj Nathan and Nate uh, Nasrallah come through the studio uh, right here actually in Phoenix. So what I did was I put the two of them on camera, I set them up, I stayed out of it, I just let them talk for 30 minutes. The conversation was fascinating. We're actually going through now and like cutting it up. There is way more value in, I think the authentic conversation that two people are not expecting to have versus maybe the structure of typical podcasts. I'm um, painting with a broad brush, but I think there's something to just letting people talk and seeing what you get out of it. And then, uh, you know, I'm assuming both sides will want to go out and share that. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, maybe one will, maybe one won't. But from my point of view, I think how we look at content is it's really about giving a gift. It's about, hey, listen, how can we highlight you as great as possible? Um, so I think a lot of people do the podcast strategies the same way. So we're just looking to be slightly different, zigging when everyone else is zagging. Can we do it so it's more about, you know, truly highlighting you versus saying, hey, listen, you know, you should follow this podcast too. I think a lot of what we do uh, can be a little bit boxy, a little bit conservative. And I think when conversation just flows and people forget cameras are on, right? I'm, I'm on camera a lot. I still know I'm being recorded right now as a podcast, but again, to that conversation that Nate and Raj had last week, they didn't even, didn't even appear to them that they were on camera. So it was just an unauth, it was an authentic, uh, no holds barred, just fast. I just sat there and I'm like, wow. And I'm checking the time to make sure. Cause I, I did have to have a capture with one of them one-on-one -on -one, and I'm like, do I have enough time? Do I have enough time? And I like, I don't want to interrupt. I don't want to interrupt these guys. This is fascinating. And I'm like, wow, this would be great cut up content, but I could just put this up as raw because it was two really interesting people having an unscripted, un -north starred conversation. Now, did you give them kind of any direction? Did you talk about no, prompt. no nope. prompts at all? Nope. Um, nope. Just, just, Hey guys, they just started, you know, chewing the fat and I just turned the cameras on just subtly just moved around the laptops, click record. And then I just sat back. And, and at one time I did try to throw in a prompted question and it kind of ruined it. Right. So I think it was just interesting. Like imagine two strangers meeting at a coffee shop who are both in the same space. And where does that conversation go? And here's my argument for thinking a little bit differently when it comes to doing video content, according to LinkedIn, 1% of people who are active, and they define active as logging on at least once a week, post any kind of text-based content. So 1% of people are posting text-based. What percentage of that post video? Maybe 1% of 1%? So I think that's the opportunity, but a lot of people are posting very similar style of video, right? So one of the things we're always trying to do is, is, can we have a unique background? So instead of being in an office, can I go downstairs in front of some graffiti or in front of some palm trees or in front of something that's a little bit different? How can we have something that's going to stop the scroll, right? And there's, a, there's an argument that I've heard many times that the algorithms actually reward unique backgrounds. So instead of like your home office, if you have a white wall or you have, you know, an outdoor scene, it's more likely to pop that up in your feed. I don't know if that's accurate, but I'll go with that. 
because I think regardless, even if it doesn't actually give you more access to the algorithm, it does get people to slow down and say, whoa, wait a minute, that's a different, where are you, Logan? Are you on a mountain? Are you in a ski slope somewhere in the 14s? Like what's going on here? And so I, that's the way I look at it, right? So I think if you are doing video and you're doing podcasts and, and you're you know clipping content, amazing. The fact that you're doing that is amazing. But let's go a level deeper. Let's go higher. What else can we get out of that? What can we do that no one else is doing? Thinking just in ways that no one else is thinking. And where that kind of came from for me was, you know, I came up on cruise ships in a very B2C sale. When I got into B2B tech SaaS specifically, which was by accident, um, it was so process driven. It has to be this way because of A, B, C, D, E. You follow that methodology, you are going to be successful or you're more likely to be successful. And I looked at that and I'm like, well, then if everyone's doing the same thing, there's an opportunity to be for disruption here, right? Just, just in a sales process. Never mind. And a great example is using videos in your sales process. When I use videos in a sales process to sell, my open rates, sky high. My response rates, sky high. And what am I doing? I'm just doing what most people aren't. Now, we know there's tools out there like Vidyard, but the reality is, is that most people still aren't using them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I'm really good friends with uh, several of the folks over at BombBomb in my neck of the woods here uh, mm -hmm. in Colorado. And there, there are folks there that have literally sent thousands of videos. They've been talking about personalized video messaging for years and years. And one of them put out a post and was like, Hey, where are we at on the adoption curve? And I'm like, personally, I've actually recently hit over a thousand videos sent, um, wow. between different platforms. And I'm like, oh, I think we're like kind of in the middle of that adoption curve. And they're like, actually, no. No, and they broke down some things like what you said there, right? If 1% of people on LinkedIn are creating text-based content, how many are, are creating video content? Then how many people are sending emails? How many people are sending video emails? So um, I, I think there's something there too in what marketers can learn from salespeople, right? Uh, we've come so far in marketing automation and we do stuff at scale and we do stuff according to the process, but how do we disrupt a little bit? How do we... How do we stand out? And you know what I love about what you just said, standing out again, so process driven in B2B tech, right? I think that, you know, I've essentially the last year worked at DemoStack in the marketing department and had been really on the sales side most of my career, although I always use marketing because I was essentially uh, doing full cycle selling on cruise ships. And, you know, when I realized that you had in marketing two extremes, you had the creative side and the analytics side. And most departments, again, going from a process-driven B2B tech history, was very analytical. And yes, lead gen is important. And yes, understanding where those leads come in. But where's the creativity, right? If everyone looks the same and sounds the same, standing out just a little bit changes the, it shifts the paradigm for people, right? Most marketing, if you look at most, you know, pick 20 random SaaS websites, they're going to look pretty similar, right? So where's the opportunity to be creative, think outside the box and just, you know, whether it's content or graphics or white, paper, like just be different. And I think people want different. I think when people see different, they're so used to the same that they see different and they're like, that's exciting. That's new. Let me at least test drive it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was actually really excited to see in a chat channel today uh, in my day job at, at Teamwork where there was an idea of like, hey, we had this customer who's actually a partner of Teamwork post about this new feature that we rolled out with our, our timesheets in the project management platform. And they were like, what if we took that and put some paid ad spend behind it? Because we're doing some of the other stuff, right? The paid ads with kind of your typical B2B SaaS graphics, right? And I was like, I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, it's going to look different. It's going to, as you said earlier, I think probably stop the scroll a little bit, uh, more, uh, more readily. Let's, as we round it out today, Nick, let's come back to the Jeep tour. How did you work with the partners that had their, you know, brands all over the Jeep, that sort of stuff, anything you would do the same, do differently there? I think if I redid the tour today, I would have a lot more partners that were interested in, in one, either paying. We were doing it for barter. Essentially, can your go-to-market team engage with our content? And some of them did a great job of that. Some of them didn't. Um, but I think, you know, I think, I think what I would do again is the first time I'm trying a concept, 
especially with partnerships, I would do it for free if I can, or, or cost coverage. Then I think once you have, you know, once you've kind of perfected the recipe, now it's something you can go out and like really try and, and, and have an opportunity to help cover costs of something like a 30 day tour around the Western U S right. So I think that's probably how I would look at it. But I think what was really interesting was, um, what we did without even kind of thinking about it as we were going through this 30 days. So there was a gifting platform that was one of the spawns or one of the partners and they gave us gift cards to a gift to our speakers. We captured all that. We captured essentially 40 interactions of people going on their phone, plugging in the code and then experiencing what it was. We cut that down. We cut 40 conversations down to a 90 second sizzle reel and people were like, wow, this is amazing. And what was so cool about it, I think, was that we showed the gift cards being very experiential. What is it, you know, because if I'm calling you, hey, Logan, uh, CRO at Company X, let me tell you, you definitely want to get these gift cards. It, it's a great way to book meetings. Sounds like a nice to have. But when I see people truly reacting to it, wow, people are like, I get this. I'm interested. I want this. How do I replicate that? You know what? I think what it is, I'll give you a great example. So coming out of B2C on a cruise ship where all the other departments, so imagine all the other, you know, people trying to sell into the same space. Um, we were not the interesting department, right? And what I realized was, was that um, I had to get people excited about what we were talking about. Um, I had to go in and solve problems for them to, so that I could create awareness and kind of give value, all these things we typically talk about. Um, but I think I'm pausing here, dude. I got lost on the fucking question. Just give it to me one more time. So when I came from B to C and I started going to B to B trade shows, I was like, everyone is like buried in their booth. If I did that on a cruise ship and I'm competing against the spa and the casino, no one's coming to my department, right? I need to be in the aisle. And one of the most popular videos I ever did was just me saying, it was me leaning into the camera saying, you know, cruise ships or, um, sorry, uh, trade shows are back online, Nick, you know, what's your strategy you're at the front of the booth, you're at the back of the booth. And I step in front of the camera and I go, I'm in the middle of the bleeping aisle. And that's how it needs to be, right? You need to be there, impactful, interesting, exciting, that you stop the scroll, but in a literal sense. And I think the fact that marketers, at least in my experience, in my very limited time in this space in B2B tech, uh, a lot of them are kind of sitting at the back of the booth and just waiting. They're like, we did all the work. We're going to wait now for the inbound. There is that activation that is critical. And that was one of the things I felt we did well on on the tour. And But I'll, I'll liken it to a trade show. What is your activation? You have Here's an example. There was this one company, and I can't remember them tomorrow. I would plug them. They were at three events in a row in September. I saw them at each one. And they had one of those things where you had to put your arm into a plexiglass container and pull out. Yes, I saw them at Inbound last year and you had to get the, the gold bar out. A gold bar. And it was almost impossible, but it was possible. And what did that do? That stopped people. That was interesting. But people still had to look at other people from the side pulling out a bar of gold. I would be in the aisle while the rest of my team is helping people pull out that bar of gold or trying to. I would be like, hey, you want to win a uh, you know $20,000 gold bar brick right now? It'll take you 18 seconds to try, right? That's the activation. That's the actually getting them from, oh, that's cute or that's cool or that's an idea to going and trying to pull that piece of gold out is the activation. And activation is so critical. But again, it's something that people miss. Yeah. There, there's so much there, man. Uh, I think the whole of the show, Logan. Yes, absolutely. Two things I'll, I'll end it on here. So get out in the aisle, and, but don't just go out alone. Go out together, right? As we've been talking about, like, even this Jeep tour was a way to get out in the aisle and get in front of people in a, in a different way, but you didn't do it alone. Just like, Hey, I'm Nick. I'm, I'm vlogging on my Jeep tour. Check out my sponsors on the, on that are plastered on the Jeep that even kind of would have still stood out a little bit, but the fact that you stop and you talk to Marcus Chan and you talk to Andy Paul and you record content, you got to stop and yep. talk to me next time you come through Colorado, man. Uh, so but, we, we went to the, we work in downtown Denver. I forget the neighborhood. There was 14 people showed up. So we Hartsfield came, Jack Doheny came, Jack Ryan came, Denver showed up on this tour like no one else. And I think part of it was that was our last stop. So people had seen this groundswell of everyone coming out 
and they want it in. So plus Denver is just a great, I love Denver. If I didn't live in Phoenix, I'd live in Denver. Teamwork's new North American office is one of the WeWorks in the Triangle building downtown Denver. So we, we, there's definitely something here, version two of this that we got to get involved with, man. I'm in, man. Um, but what I was going to say there is get out in the aisle and get out there with other people, bring them along. And I think it, it parallels something that, you know, just a, a few weeks back, the announcement about the partner hacker and reveal partnership and the launch of nearbound.com, even in just what you said there, you know, our marketing, we have been sitting at the back of the booth waiting for the inbound to just do its job. Right. But we don't want to be too aggressive and just, just rely on outbound. We want to get nearbound. We want to get out in the aisle. We want to get out there with others um, and be near where people are walking by because that's where the attention is. And, you know, as whether you love them or hate them, Gary V always says we're day trading attention in marketing and that, and that's our role. Right. So Amen. I think that's a great spot to end it. Nick, thank you so much for this, man. Uh, this is going to be one of many conversations I'm sure you and I are going to have from here. Definitely kindred spirits. And for everybody listening, thank you for spending time with Nick and I today. Get out in that aisle and stand there with uh, other folks that have the attention and have a similar message to you, because I think that just reinforces the message of the show that we go further faster when we're marketing together. <laughs>